Well, hey there, folks. Welcome to the Caledonia Gathering. My name is Corey, and today we're continuing our conversation called Love Letter. Well, thanks again so much for joining us online. You know, it's our mission to tell people about the life and the love of Jesus and to inspire you to learn to live and love like him. And, and if that's something you're interested in, you haven't done so yet, we really wanna encourage you to hit the subscribe button down below. Now, before we jump back into our conversation called Love Letter, where we're looking at this letter that the Apostle John wrote to his fracturing communities to, to see what it might have to say to us, before we jump back into that, we're going to get our hearts and our minds in the right place by singing together. So, let's sing. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to gain he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this i hold my hope is only jesus for my life is wholly bound to him how strange and divine I can sing All is mine, yet not I But through Christ in me The night is dark But I am not forsaken For by my side The Savior, He will stay I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my Savior will defend me through the deepest valley. He will lead. Oh, the been one and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me no fate I dread I know I am forgiven the future sure the price it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave.
You know, music is a powerful tool for enhancing experience. The entire point of a soundtrack in a movie is, is to heighten the emotion and enhance the experience of any given scene, right? I mean, soundtracks can raise the drama or the tension or, or the celebration, the wonder and the awe. In, in any movie, the soundtrack playing underneath the scene plays a massive role. In his book called Soundtracks, a book about overthinking, John Acuff likens musical soundtracks to, to the thoughts that we have in our heads all the time. We have thought soundtracks that, that we play over and over, and, and they actually affect our experience. Thoughts that we, we play on repeat in our minds that over time have an impact on how we live our lives. Now, let me just share one small example from my own life. It, it's the thought that People only love me for what I do, not for who I am. As a pastor, that means if I'm not good at what I do, then I won't be loved, I'll be laughed. Now, that soundtrack, for the most part, is untrue. While some people might only love me for these 20 minutes on a Sunday morning, for the most part, the relationships that mean the most in my life, they could care less about how good I am at what I do. But that soundtrack dramatically affects my experience of life. When I let it play on repeat over and over, it can make one poorly delivered sermon feel like the greatest failure of all time, from which there is no coming back. You see, that's what broken soundtracks do. They, they can lead to somber experiences of life. My guess is that if we talked long enough, we could probably figure out what some of your broken soundtracks are too, right? Thoughts that play on repeat over and over having an impact on how you experience your life. Maybe, maybe your soundtracks say things like, I'm too old to change, or, or I'm not smart enough for that, or, or I'll never be that talented. Or, you know, maybe you have other soundtracks that, that sound more like, you know, I'm not hot enough, I'm not good looking enough, I'm not beautiful or sexy or attractive like that. Maybe you say, think things like, I'm not strong or skilled, I'm not a great parent, friend, or sibling. Our soundtracks, they, they live deep within us and sometimes say hurtful things like, like if they really knew me, there's no way they'd still love me or I'll never be forgiven or I am unlovable. We all have these soundtracks, these thoughts that play on repeat. David Goggins, who's a retired Navy SEAL, he once said that the most important conversation you'll ever have in your life are the conversations that take place between your ears. They're important because what you say to yourself, what you think over and over, the soundtracks that you listen to on repeat, they will impact the way that you live your life. I mean, you're never going to change careers if, if you keep telling yourself you're too old to change or you're too old to learn something new. You're never going to experience the, the security and, and the love and of authentic relationships if you keep listening to the soundtrack in your head that says, these people will leave you if they truly knew you. I mean, your soundtracks can have a dramatic impact on how you live your life. Which is actually why I think John takes this poetic soliloquy that we're about to read it's, it's this moment in the letter where he steps out of his normal teaching to give his readers some new, repeatable soundtracks. But before we get to them, I, I just want to kind of reorient you to where we are in the overall conversation. We're in this series called Love Letter, where the Apostle John, one of Jesus' closest disciples, he's writing this letter to a fracturing community in, in order to mitigate against some misinformation flying around that's causing people to mistreat one another. You see, there are all these preachers around claiming to know what it means to be human and how to relate to God and the divine. And, and on top of that, th those claims, these preachers, they're demanding that you must choose their side, their way of seeing everything in order to remain a part of the community. And a community of people who are forced to choose sides is going to always lead to a community of people being torn apart. And so John writes to his churches to reaffirm for them where the truth about God and, and how to relate to one another, where the truth about all that comes from. And it's not some sage on a stage preacher. It's from Jesus. It, in fact, the foundation of the church's fellowship, says John, is the facts about Jesus. So he, John, repeatedly affirms in this letter that he's simply giving people, not his opinions, not his hunches, but simply the facts about Jesus. What he saw Jesus do, what he heard Jesus say, that's the foundation for how we live our lives. That's how we, as John puts it, 
live in the light. Now, up until this point in the letter, John has offered two of his four conditions for living in the light. The first condition was to be a person of confession, not perfection. Be a person of confession, not perfection. That, that's condition number one. Condition number two, as we talked about last week, was to comply with Jesus' commands. If you're going to live in the light, it means you listen to what Jesus says, and you do what Jesus says to do. And, and ultimately, Jesus' command was summarized as this, love one another the way that I have loved you. And when you fall short on condition number two, refer back to condition number one, be a person of confession, not perfection. Now, today we're going to get to the third condition, which I would call identity. It's all about identity. In, in other words, what you believe about yourself will shape how you live. What you believe about you will shape how you live your life. Here's how John puts it in the next part of the letter. Verse 12. I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you were strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. This is the new soundtrack that John wants his people to play on repeat. He uses a bit of a poetic style, but, but it's intentionally repetitive. Your sins are forgiven because of Jesus on account of his name. You know him who is from the beginning. That's Jesus. And knowing Jesus is what has allowed you to overcome the evil one. These are not things that you have to accomplish. These are things that have already been accomplished for you. So put them on repeat between your ears. I'm forgiven. I know Jesus. His love has overcome evil. I'm forgiven. I know Jesus. His love has overcome evil. Now, it's important to pause and just, I want to just point out some stuff here that, that John's not addressing children and then fathers and then young men and intentionally leaving out young women and, and, and mothers and grandparents. That's not what he's doing. He, he's using a pre-existing poetic format to address the whole community. His point is to call together the whole church, regardless of age, and say, look, this is what is true of every follower of Jesus. Infant, young, old, this is the soundtrack you should put on repeat. Your sins have been forgiven. If you know Jesus, you know God. And because of his love, you have already overcome evil. So repeat it. I am forgiven. I know Jesus. And his love has helped me overcome. Now, it's really important for John to lay down that soundtrack and put it on repeat for what he's about to say next. Verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Now, it's worth just pausing here for a minute to ask the question, uh, we're not supposed to love the world? Isn't John the one who wrote the most famous passage in the entire Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world? God so loved the world, now we're not supposed to love the world? Well, what are we supposed to do with that, John? Which is a really good question. The good news is John clarifies what he means. Verse 16, when he says, do not love the world. For everything in the world, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. You see, by the world, John is talking about these idle temptations in the world. So let's get into it. Remember, condition number three for living in the light, for following Jesus, is all about identity. Recognizing that what you believe about yourself will shape how you live. And so after affirming that soundtrack, I am forgiven, I know Jesus, his love helps me overcome, John turns his attention to the distracting desires that pull us away from that identity. And he lists three of them. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, lust carries with it an overtly sexual tone in our culture. So let me go ahead and desexualize it for just a quick sec. The Greek word here is epithumia. It, it literally means just passion or desperate desire. So John's literally talking about 
the desperate desires of the flesh and the eyes. But, but let's start where he starts. First, there is the desperate desire of the flesh, the epithumia of the flesh. Mostly it has to do with the desperate desire for food and sex. Now, for the most part, in John's world and culture, um, they viewed food and sex in very similar ways. They thought that our bodies have natural appetites for them, and so it's natural for us to seek to satisfy those appetites. But it's important to notice that John's problem isn't with the flesh itself. John doesn't have a problem with food and sex. No, his problem is with the unhealthy degree to which we let those desires, those epithumia, direct our lives. When food or sex become the object of supreme importance to us, the apple of our affections, they, they become tremendously problematic. John's not saying any of this because he's prude or, or, or he doesn't want people to enjoy the pleasures of life. But as we mentioned before, it's, it's because these desires have the tendency to warp our identity. When food or sex start to alter the way you see yourself, what you tell yourself, what you believe about yourself, it becomes a problem. You see, when you start to base your identity, in, in other words, when you start to find your value and security as a person in life from your sexuality, you know, whether or not you, you look sexually appealing, or, or how far you've gone physically with a girlfriend or boyfriend, or, or how many people you've slept with, or, or how many people you haven't slept with, or what kinds of people you want to sleep with. When, when your value is centered in that, it becomes problematic. What John is saying is that, that when your self-worth is tied up in your sexuality, the love of the Father is not in you. In, in other words, you're not treating yourself with the love that your heavenly Father has for you. And listen, th this isn't really an, an indictment from John. It's an invitation. John's saying in this passage, hey, hey, remember who you are. You're a child who knows the forgiveness of your heavenly father because you know Jesus. You know that you are worth so much that Jesus thought you were worth dying for. Knowing that means that you have what it takes to overcome the lust of the flesh that leads you to find that security elsewhere. A lust that lies to you about where your value and worth come from. A lust that leads you to dehumanize other people, treating them like objects who exist for your own sexual pleasure. Don't go chasing after what the world is chasing after, says John. Don't let the desire of your flesh become your supreme object of devotion. Get rid of the broken soundtrack that says, oh, I just need to be more sexually appealing. I, I just need to post more revealing photos. I, I need to get with more guys or girls in order to be valuable. Re replace that broken soundtrack with a better one. My heavenly father loved me so much, he thought I was worth dying for. Because I know Jesus, I know that love. And because of that, I can overcome this temptation. You see, it's, it's all about identity. It's about what you believe about your own value and security, where that comes from. You see, the same of sex is true of food and drink. If you're only happy when you're eating or drinking, or if you're only happy when you're eating and drinking the highest quality food, or, or if your desire for food and drink leads you to trample others, endanger the environment, treat those living in other nations unjustly, you've got a problem. The love of the Father isn't in you. But, but again, that, that's not an indictment. It's an invitation. Don't use food as, as a facade over your feelings. Don't, don't let your desire for drinks keep you from being honest about what's going on inside. You are a loved child of God. Your heavenly Father thought you were worth dying for. So get rid of that broken soundtrack that says, oh, eating this will make me feel better. Drinking this will give me the reprieve I'm looking for. And replace it with the soundtrack that says, I am forgiven, I am loved, and I can overcome this. And at the same time, remember that God also so loved the people whose lives are, are impacted by our food purchasing choices every day. I mean, coffee farmers enslaved in El Salvador just to satisfy the lusts of our flesh? No, says John. Remember who you are. Remember how loved you are and what that love cost. And let that love, identi uh, let that identity empower you to overcome the lusts of the flesh. The second lust on the list was the lust of the eyes. 
Now, generally, this is about what you can see. In other words, it's the lust for material goods and wealth. Again, John doesn't have a problem with owning nice things, but it's the lust for, the, the desperate, deep desire for material wealth that becomes the problem. And, and here's why it matters and why John puts it on the list. Because it can lead to all kinds of identity issues. When your self-worth is tied up in your net worth, that's an identity problem. When your personal value comes from your financial portfolio, that's an identity problem. It, it's, a so, it's a broken soundtrack that says, I only matter as much as the money I make. I only matter as much as the amount in my account. It, it's also a lust for the eyes that forces your life to be directed by, by a concern for what people will perceive of you. I mean, when your value and security in life come from being able to live in a particular house or drive a certain kind of car or wear a certain brand of clothing or a style or send your kids to a particular school, you're in trouble. If your soundtrack says, I'm failing as a person or a parent if I fall short on these things, that's a problematic soundtrack. Not only can it make you a slave to the opinions of others, but it can make you a literal financial slave to Visa or MasterCard or the mortgage company or the bank. On top of all that, living by the lust of your eyes will limit what you can do for the sake of others. The lust of the eyes can literally limit your love for others because when everything is tied up in paying the mortgage or the car payment or the tuition payment, there's not much left for anyone else. That's why John can say so confidently that if you are filled with the lust of the eyes, then the love of the Father is not in you. There's no room for it. But that's why identity matters so much for John. Remember, says John, you are not your things. You are not your income. You are not your house. You are not your car. You are a loved child of God valued so highly that Jesus thought you were worth dying for. He didn't free you from the slavery of sin so that you could go become a slave to something or someone else. You have the power in Christ to overcome the lust of the eyes. Remember your identity, says John. The last thing on the list is not a lust, but it's related. John calls it the pride of life, the arrogance of life. There's a pride that flows naturally from the person who believes that they can and should acquire any amount of material wealth they desire. There's a boastfulness that, that uses other people in order to boost their own sense of value or self-worth. There's an arrogance to ignoring how your lusts impact the lives of others. John calls it the pride of life. But again, it's not an indictment, it's an invitation. An invitation to embrace a new soundtrack. If you want to live in the light, the third condition is to embrace and repeat your identity over and over and over so that you can continue to overcome the problematic challenges of the world. Remember that you are so loved by your heavenly Father that he gave his one and only Son to pay the price for your forgiveness. Jesus thought you were worth dying for. I mean, there is no number of sexual escapades or, or exotic foods or material goods and gains that will do for your value and security what knowing that someone thought you were worth dying for does. You see, condition number three, says John, is all about identity. To know that you are so loved. And, and here's why this matters so much to me and, and why I think it should matter to you. Our world needs people who walk in this kind of light right now. I mean, so many of our problems in this world can be linked back to this list of lusts. Lusts of the flesh leading us to mistreat and objectify one another or, or treat those around the world unjustly just so that we can satisfy our cravings. The lust of the eyes, finding our self-worth and our net worth or the appearance of wealth, leading to a lack of generous love, making us slaves to the banks, the credit cards, or the, or the opinions of others. Friends, the, the world needs you to be a light. And condition number three for living in the light is to remember your identity in order to overcome the flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life. In Christ you have, and in Christ you still can Maybe that's a soundtrack worth repeating. In Christ I have, and in Christ I can. In Christ I have, and in Christ I can.
you believe is true about you? I mean, that's kind of the question, right? What, what, are the, what are the conversations that go on between your ears, the thoughts that you play on repeat? I want to invite you to, to take on John's third condition, to, to take on his soundtrack. I, I am forgiven. I know Jesus, and I can overcome. I am forgiven. I know Jesus, and I can overcome. Or, or maybe the shorter, you know, in Christ I have. And in Christ I can. In Christ I already have. And in Christ I still can. Or perhaps it's the benediction that we use every week to remind yourself who it is that you are connected to, why you matter, and how much you matter. To, to go with the love of your Heavenly Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Put that on. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above you.